thoughts, have long imagined a world where you could go out and explore the cosmos remotely, where you could have a system that would help you restore mobility, restore function, in systems that would enable you to do things like monitor wildfires and address them instantly, right? There's a long history of our imagination running wild with what robots could do, right? This is documented in science fiction going back to the 50s and before by greats like Asimov and Heinlein and Clark. And the idea was robots could be there to be better versions of ourselves, to make our lives better. Where are we today with robotic systems? Well, there's been incredible gains that have been made in the last five or 10 years. We have robots from companies like Boston Dynamics that are running outside, that are doing backflips. This is really incredible. This is something that I couldn't have imagined 20 years ago, right? And you've all seen these videos, probably really incredible stuff. Not only that, but we have robots that are gonna start to explore the cosmos. We already have rovers on Mars. We have a humanoid robot on the space station going above our heads and we're gonna be sending a helicopter to Mars in 2020. So we're starting to take robots and extend ourselves through them. Finally, we're starting to see robots helping people live better lives. So this is by Rewalk, it's a lower body exoskeleton for paraplegics. This is a paraplegic walking in the device with the aid of some crutches. And again, this is what we wanna do. We wanna use this power, this technology in a positive way to help people live better lives. But there's one important point here that all these videos don't show. So what's the secret below it all? Well, first, in the context of this exoskeleton, there's a hint. The hint is that it requires crutches. Why does it require crutches? It, because all the videos you just saw, however amazing they are, were the one time it worked after a thousand times of trying to make it work. So Boston Dynamics, I give them a ton of credit because they show outtakes of when it didn't work on their robots. <laughs> So it gets worse. This is a bad day. It's a bad robot day. So we also have the backflip, which was amazing. And here's some outtakes from the backflip. Yep. Again, these are the thousands of runs that you run before it finally works the way it should. And just to make it clear, I'm not picking on everyone else but myself. Here's a robot at Caltech, Cassie. This was built by Agility Robotics, but we'll be running our own algorithms on it. And we were like, let's demo this. So some kids were outside of our building and we put it in front of the kids and they got really excited and they were taking pictures and this is all wonderful. And then, <laughs> just a face plant. So I'm not immune to this, the fact that it takes a lot of work to get robots to work. <laughs> there's a grad student running in. I was there, I didn't make it in. It was my grad student that came in to save the day. So, so where does this put everything? What's the point of this? The point of this is twofold. First, we imagine robots doing all these amazing things. Why aren't they doing them today? And I would argue the big thing that's happening is there's a gap right now. There's a gap between what we understand mathematically about the world and about robots and what we can actually get robots to do. And the ultimate goal of getting robots into the real world is to bridge this gap to bridge this understanding so that when we do something, we can put it on the robot, it will work the first time, every time. And at the core of making that happen is mathematics. So let me get slightly technical for one second and explain this process of what robots look like and why it matters. Well, it matters, again, because we can get it on robots that walk outside, we can get it on robotic assisted devices, but we have to start at the mathematical level. So let me just give you a microcosm. You always see robots doing these amazing things. What actually goes on here? How do we actually make these robots do things? Well, the first thing you have to do is start with the equations. You have to start with the math, the physics describing the system. So what you see on the screen behind me is a small set, a, a, just a little component of the equations describing the robot in the picture. These equations are hundreds of megabytes long. They're massive. And they're all complicated. You can't really see it here, but they're sines and cosines and squares. They're nonlinear. They're really daunting in their complexity. So we have to start with those, though, because those govern the forward evolution of the system. Once we take those equations, we pair it with what we think walking should look like. So models of locomotion, let's say. And then what theorems do is they take all that mathematics and they distill it down to the essence, the understanding of what walking and locomotion really is. And we mathematically prove that, in fact, we can generate this walking on robots. Now, that math is great. Of course, how do we get it to work in practice is the real question. Well, what math really does is it gives algorithms. Those algorithms, 
which you see running here in this little screenshot, generate the walking behaviors that finally go on the robot. So that's the process that's underlying all of these things. And let me just kind of show you an example of this theorem in action. So this theorem is running on this robot via algorithms that were developed by my students and myself at our research lab. And, and so what's happening here is this robot is walking dynamically with everything on board in a natural human-like way. Now the key point here is no human data went into generating this walking. In fact, this walking is just purely a function of the dynamics that are inherent to the system itself. In fact, the walking comes from making the robot walk in the way that we walk. That is having heel strike, toe strike, and a toe lift in its feet. And then it also comes from the fact that there's springs in the ankles that we store energy and release. And the result of the physics interfacing with the mathematics is this natural human-like locomotion. So what else do theorems give us? What else does mathematics give us? It gives us generality. So once we understand how to do this on one robot, we don't have to repeat the process all over again. Rather, we can take a totally different robot, in this case, Cassie, which I mentioned earlier, and we can take and apply the same procedure. You don't even have to look at all the stuff in this because I've explained it all to you already. And we can get walking on flat ground in the lab. We can get walking even outside now, in this case, on some flat ground outside. And then finally, we can even get walking on some rough terrain, meaning that this math and these theorems are robust enough that they let us do this in, in environments that we didn't actually plan for. In fact, we can take really aggressive terrain to a certain degree. So this is a root system at Caltech right outside of our building. And you see that the robot's kind of dancing a little bit here. It's, having, it's giving it a go, trying to walk through this very tough terrain <laughs> until it falls. It did pretty well, though, right? It almost made it. We'll watch it one more time because it's actually really amazing. Now remember, all of this is the mathematics in action. We're not planning here. This is just using the dynamics of the system to try to walk almost all the way. So the other thing about theorems that's really nice is it's not restricted to only bipeds. In fact, we can apply the same general mathematics to quadrupeds. Quadrupeds are basically just two bipeds that are kind of working together to carry this thing in the middle, right? And so this is the same exact root system that Cassie walked on, but now it turns out the quadruped can actually handle it. You'll see it actually gets a little bit of air time there in the process. And then ends up finishing, the, finishing and not falling in this case, which is very nice. So we can apply this to different platforms, which is really exciting. Finally, we can do different behaviors. This is jumping, Cassie again. In this case, Cassie jumps about seven inches in the air, meaning its feet are seven inches off the ground. I think this is probably almost better than I could do. Uh, and again, the point is, once we understand that this physics of movement, this, this mathematical understanding of movement, we can make robots and different types of robots do amazing things. So the question now becomes, why do we care? This is really cool, and this is fun, and the videos are great, and it's great seeing robots do amazing things, but why do we care? And I think the point here is that with this understanding, with understanding comes responsibility. And taking this to an, a, a domain where we can actually help people live better lives. And let's be real, however cool robots jumping is, that's not going to make your life better, right? Well, maybe for a second when you watch the video, but beyond that, it won't, it won't help you all too much. But imagine if we can take and translate this understanding to making people walk better. And this is the, this is the merit in studying bipedalism. Because now that we understand how to get human-like walking on bipedal robots, at a fundamental and mathematical level, we can translate it to things like prosthetics and exoskeletons, right? Because this is all math, it's all general. We can view the human in a general way and have them interact with the device. In particular, we can actually do this very concretely and very scientifically. We can start with, a, let's say, a walking robot. And we can take this theorem and translate it to the device as if it was a prosthetic. And that lets us equally take the same ideas and put it on prosthetic devices. So this is an actual amputee walking with our first generation prosthetic that was custom built by my lab. We've since made these prosthetics even better. This is our, our, one of our latest generation prosthetic devices. Again, it's kind of amazing that my students have built this by hand. They machine this, they put it all together, all the electronics, all the algorithms, all through their hard work. And then we take the math, the theorem, and put it on here. And again, just like we could take robots outside, we can take these prosthetic devices outside. So in this case, two of my students are walking with a prosthetic around Caltech. They can handle terrains. They can handle some different environments. So this is, this is what we want to do, is translate these technologies. But we can take these ideas even a step further. And this is, this is more challenging, more, more fun. 
So a few years back, we started working with this startup company in France, of, uh, of all places, and they had this idea, they bravely had this idea that they wanted to take the math that we developed for walking robots and put it on exoskeletons for paraplegics. So they designed and built this, this hardware, but we took the math that we have for walking and put it on the device itself. So my grad student is in, this, in the video you're about to see here, helping them test out some of these algorithms. Now the important thing is if we can make this walk dynamically on its own, what can we do? We can put people into it, and they can walk dynamically, even if they can't walk themselves. So what you'll see here is first a demonstration that the exoskeleton can walk on its own with nobody in it. So it, we have a dummy in it, and it's walking dynamically, again, through the same map. But now we put a paraplegic in it. So this user is a complete paraplegic, meaning he has absolutely no function of his legs and has not for 10 years. And this is the first example of dynamic walking, crutch-free walking with a paraplegic that's ever been demonstrated. It's a, it's a powerful moment when you can realize that this, that this passion of yours, this mathematical understanding that you obsess over all the time, can actually go out and help people. You know, I heard stories of this clinical testing, the loved ones around them really connected with seeing them for the first time upright, walking in a natural and dynamic way. So this is where we want to take these ideas. And in this context at Caltech, we're fortunate enough through this collaboration that we have one of these devices at Caltech now. And so what we're able to do is test it in action, test new ideas in the process, and try to bring them to a case where we can actually have robots and people work together. So that's the vision underlying all this is we want an environment where robots and people can interact in positive and beneficial ways. So it's not really fair that you got to see a bunch of videos of robots walking and don't get to see one yourself. So I'd like to welcome Cassie to the stage. So this, is, this robot was built by Agility Robotics, but is running all of the math that I showed you today meaning the mathematics under the hood is what was developed by my students and myself and collaborators in our lab. And you see that it has a very dynamic feel to its walking. That's because, again, we're leveraging the dynamics of locomotion. So in this case, you'll notice that Cassie has very small feet. That's why it has to keep moving. It also has springs, so it has these compliance that has to go through to help balance the system. So we can even do things. So, so we're going to try first here and head up on the... Let's go. Good job, Cassie. So Cassie got onto the, the TED dot. This might be one of the first robots that's been walking on the TED dot dynamically. And so it's able to handle all of these terrains exactly because of what I talked about earlier, taking these concepts and generalizing them mathematically so that we can characterize locomotion. And these are the same algorithms we ultimately put on exoskeletons to help people walk better. And you can imagine, somebody who can't walk, now walking with these algorithms and able to even handle a little bit of disturbances, get pushed on a little bit, so we can start to get close to robots. Again, years ago, I wouldn't have imagined being able to stand next to a dynamic walking robot and actually put my hand on it and interact with it. And that's where we're at today. And that's where we want to head tomorrow, is more and more of this human and robots working together in a positive way to affect change. So with that, thank you very much. <laughs>